Well, it may seem altogether obvious, but the first step in being cured of blindness is to recognize that we indeed are blind. Hey, everybody, welcome to SJC's online worship experience. So excited you're with us today. If you're new, if it's your first time, I want to welcome you. You're in the right spot. We're going to continue our Lenten message series called Human. And today we'll be in John chapter 9 with an incredible story of a man who was born blind, but who gets healed by the one and only Jesus. It's going to be a powerful time today of prayer, worship, time in God's word. So let's get ready to do it, everybody. reading from John. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. 
He was born blind so that God's work would be revealed in him. We must work the works of who sent him while it is day. Night is coming. No one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Then he went and washed and came back and was able to see. The neighbors and those who have sent, seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how are your eyes to open? He said, answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Salaam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. Then they said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought the Pharisees to the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him, Now he had received his sight. He said to him, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, and I now see. Some of the Pharisees said, This is a man, not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others say, How can a man who has sinned perform such signs? And then they were divided. So he said again to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews do not believe that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of the man, who had received his sight, and asked them, Is this your son, who says he was born blind? Then how does he see now? His parents answered, We know now that this is our son, and he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Asked him, He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that anyone confessed Jesus would be a Messiah, would be put out to the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So, for the second day, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, he answered. But I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, though, is that I was blind, now I see. They say to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? You would also want to become his disciples? They reviled him and said, saying, You are his disciple, but we are the disciples of Moses, and we know that God has spoken to Moses. But as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to ones who worship him and obey his wills. Never since the world began, it is heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely of sins, and you are trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard them, heard that they had driven him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came up to this world for judgment, so those who do not see may see and those who do not see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees have near him heard this and said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to him, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say, we see, your sin remains. The word of the Lord. Well, hey everybody, making sense of a broken world is the quintessential human endeavor. This endeavor leads to levels of conviction about ourselves, about God, faith, life. In a pluralist Western world, one of the critiques of Christianity 
has to do with certitude or convictions. Convictions around truth claims can come across as elitist or exclusionary. Admittedly, how Christians carry truth convictions may have something to do with the world's perception of Christianity itself. We should always examine the way in which our Christian convictions shape our posture in and toward the world. Christian certitude should lead to Christian servitude. Never a smug attitude, but always chiefly gratitude. You can see I had a little fun with that there. And if our primary certainty is something other than the love of God for undeserving sinners like ourselves and for our neighbors, we probably have some praying that we need to do. Leslie Newbegin wrote that, quote, the church is not sent into the world to explain the world necessarily, but to change the world. Jesus has come and is coming and will come into the world. Only by being part of his movement into the world do we make sense of the world, close quote. But a life built on conviction, no matter the conviction, will always draw criticism. No one embodied the servitude and self-giving of the Christian life like Jesus himself. And he was loved by many to be sure, but he was also scorned and rejected by many because an unbelieving world is filled with certainties of its own. The Christian claim to truth is only one among thousands of religions, spiritualities, philosophies, and worldviews. And everyone pulls a ticket for one of them, or maybe multiple tickets, even if their certainty is that there is no certainty, which is an absolute truth claim in and of itself. Bottom line, we're all theologians. It's a human thing. You can't be human and not be a theologian. We all live by a faith conviction. It's not really a question of do you have any beliefs or convictions that you live your life by. The question is which beliefs, what convictions, what certainties guide your life? Clarity is so vital. In his great primer on the Christian faith called Simply Christian, N.T. Wright describes our post-enlightenment secular age as being a landscape of ferocious spiritual hunger. He warns, quote, people who have been starved for water for a long time will drink anything, if, even if it's polluted. People kept without food for long periods of time will eat anything they can find from grass to uncooked meat. Thus, by itself, spirituality may appear to be part of the problem as well as part of the solution." Close quote. You know, sometimes our assertions can be built on a wrong premise, which is often the case when it comes to our understanding of God. The Pharisees' convictions about the law and the misinterpretation of some parts and aspects of the law and the mission of God in general in the world along with their prideful need to cling to power and control, warped their theology. When the disciples asked Jesus about the man who was uh, blind from birth here in John 9, when they asked him who sinned, him or his parents, they were revealing a false notion about the relationship between sickness and sin. The common assumption among the Jews in Jesus' day was that sin was the causality of every and any sickness, of, of every and any malady or disease. Hence the question, but that reduces our understanding of sin and a biblical understanding of sin and of God to a caricature not found in scripture or in our lived experience. We've all sinned and seemingly got away with it. And we've all experienced suffering and loss through no direct fault of our own. But Jesus will paint with no such simple brush. The world he came to rescue is not operating by karma and its hopeless end, it's operating by redeeming love and the constant care and concern of the God of covenant, which is why, which is why the answer to the question who sinned doesn't quite fit. It's more nuanced than that, than that way more nuanced. It's more bound up in the mystery of life in a world bound up in the woes of sin and death generally. The world may be broken, but rest assured God is never petty. While it's true that every ounce of darkness, evil, malady, disease, and fracture finds its point of entry in the sin and rebellion of humanity in the garden, it's not true that our individual sin always correlates to suffering and punishment in this life. If that were so, none of us would make it out the door in the morning. Jesus says it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him, close quote which means that God will take our very limitations, our weaknesses, our refusals, 
our weak hands that we've been dealt, our pain, our sorrow, our grief, our fear, our darkness, our lack, and fill it up with light. He takes the raw materials of our lostness uh, that we might be found. When I understand my blindness, His grace opens up my eyes. In fact, He's making beauty from ashes and He's doing it all the time. John's Gospel is a sprawling meditation on the redemptive re recapitulation of the creation story in Genesis. In the very beginning, God spoke to a chaotic, formless, and void vastness and brought out order, meaning, and wholeness, beauty, and thoughtfulness to His special creation and to His image bearers. John, the Gospel of John, bridges the story of creation of first light with the second story of redemption, where into a darkened world, a world shadowed by sin and death, the light of redeeming love appears. Where there is disorder, darkness, and death, Jesus has come to bring light. Genesis speaks of the glory of creation. John in his Gospel speaks of the glory of recreation through the redemption that God provides through Jesus. But John is careful to say, that not everyone is receptive to this. He writes in John chapter 1, quote, The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but born of God, close quote. You see, John highlights this reality through the many confrontations initiated by the scribes and Pharisees challenging Jesus' authority, denying the fruit of Jesus' works, and rejecting Jesus' words as blasphemy. In John chapter 7 and 8, uh, it shows the intensity of the Pharisees' resistance toward Jesus and their total rejection of his ministry. They seek to have him arrested. They incite violence against Jesus. They discredit Jesus with every opportunity seeking to undermine his, his teaching of the kingdom. Why? Why would they refuse to receive the light from Jesus? Well, John gives us an answer in his conversation with Nicodemus uh, in John chapter 3. Uh, and this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, Jesus says, and people love darkness rather than light, close quote. See, Jesus exposes their lust for power and authority and control and our lust for power, authority and control, which brings us to this episode in John 9, the healing of the man born blind, which becomes comical in the lengths Jesus' opponents go to discredit the blind man and the healing and Jesus' authority. The irony is that there are two blind parties here, but only one party knows it or realizes it. The blind beggar is the recipient of Jesus' healing authority. He puts a mud poultice on the blind man's eyes and commands him to wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. He does that very thing and he's healed. He can see it causes a stir in the neighborhood. Is that the blind beggar guy? Some say it is. Some say, no way, it just looks like him. Couldn't be him. Couldn't possibly be him. The Pharisees swing into action. They interrogate the blind man who's been healed. Tell us what happened, how it happened, when it happened, who did this, etc. The man, Jesus, the guy replies, put mud on my eyes and told me to go and wash, and I did, and I was healed, and I can see. Some of the Pharisees rejected this immediately, since healing, the healing took place on a Sabbath day, which was strictly forbidden according to their interpretation of the law. But some of the Pharisees were conflicted because, well, who could open the eyes of the blind if they weren't from God? What does, this, uh, what does the blind man say about Jesus? He confesses that he must be a prophet. Still unsatisfied, the Pharisees inquire of the man's parents, who were fearful of the, th the authorities, uh, fearful of being thrown out of the synagogue. The parents acknowledged the man as their son indeed and that he had been healed, but the parents leave the explanation up to their son since he was an adult and could speak for himself. One last time, they circle back to the man born blind saying, give glory to God, which means speak as one under oath. Referring to Jesus, they say to the man, we know this man is a sinner, to which the healed man says, quote, whether he's a sinner, I don't know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see, close quote. Notice what each party knows. The Pharisees know that Jesus is a sinner. And the blind man knows that he's been healed. And from this humble place of having received from Jesus, 
the man born blind begins to do what all who have been loved and known by Jesus are called to do. They simply bear witness, not out of our expertise or out of his expertise to be sure, but out of our experience of him. And one of the most humorous invitations in all of scripture, the man says to the Pharisees, quote, I've told you already and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Close quote. Which is so funny because the man probably asked the Pharisees this question from a place of genuine speculation, not sarcasm. But that humor ends there. They revile him saying, you are his disciple, but we're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. To that, the blind man who had been healed answered, why this is amazing. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes, close quote. To which the Pharisees accuse him, the blind man, of being an utterly sinful man as well. And they kick him out of the synagogue, which is, which is essentially to expel the man from the community at large, denying, denying his dignity to be an accepted member of the neighborhood. This was actually a severe persecution of uh, this man. Later in the story, Jesus finds the man and says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. John writes, The blind man became a recipient of two healings, a physical healing of his physical blindness and the spiritual healing of his spiritual blindness for nothing special that he had done other than uh, to recognize his own weakness and inability. He was humbled already. He had nothing to lose and everything to gain. He knew nothing for certain until Jesus appeared in his life and became his witness and follower. The Pharisees, ironically, were also blind. In the darkness of their own power, authority, and control, and their striving for those things, they rejected Jesus on the basis of their certainty about how God worked and their darkened interpretation of God's law. Beware, brothers and sisters, our own certainties, whatever they may be, that refuse to see Jesus as Lord or that keep him locked away from our lives. Our own certainties that seek independence from the person of Jesus, from the atoning love of God through the death and resurrection of Jesus, and from the reconciling power of the grace of God that continues to transform the world through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when we are certain that we are understand the world by rejecting Jesus or pushing him to the margins, then the certainty of our sight has become a blindness, a blindness to Jesus as the light of the world. In all truth, we are much more prone to the sin of, of the certainty of the Pharisees than we could ever imagine. Isn't that the problem with the Christian faith, you might ask? The certainty they have about who God is, etc. Perhaps a fair question. But the Christian faith grounds its certainty in the death and resurrection of the person of Jesus. That if Jesus appeared in history, and if the historical gospel accounts are accurate, and there is good evidence that we can trust them as credible, then Jesus is the fulfillment of Old Testament longing, hope, and promise. And Jesus is Lord of heaven and earth. And Jesus has indeed vanquished sin and death. And our faith then can rest with certitude on him. You may not consider yourself to have arrived in your faith just yet, and that's okay. Keep seeking and keep asking, keep knocking for revealed truth. He will show you himself. There's a beautiful progression in the healed man's experience in John 9. A gradual reception of the light of Christ. He says initially, that the man Jesus healed me. He acknowledges him by name. He later acknowledges that Jesus must indeed be a prophet. And then when he finally sees Jesus for the first time, Jesus asks the man, do you believe in the Son of Man? Which was a reference to the Son of Man in Daniel 7. He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus says, you've seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believed, and he worshiped him. Listen to Jesus' sobering assessment. For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and they said to Jesus, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now you say we see, your guilt remains. 
It's all too human to claim a certainty that rests outside of Jesus's lordship, but it's a certain blindness, whether it's a religious certainty or an irreligious certainty. That's the plight of a darkened world. Jesus came as the light of the world. Jesus hasn't come to condemn, but to bring light. Judgment remains, though, when we reject the light in favor of darkness. And it's all too human to ask God why, to ask God how, when, what. These are good questions, but let us also ask who? Who are you? Who is this Jesus? Well, he is your salvation, the light of the world. Who is he to you? Do you believe in the Son of Man? Do you believe in Jesus? Thanks be to God. Amen. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light Darkness tries to hide trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God oh see how great how great is our God
give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever amen i sought the lord and he answered me he delivered me from my fears i sought the lord and he answered me he delivered me from my fears i'm not scared friends, thank you so much for being a part of our online worship experience today from wherever you're connecting, whenever you're connecting with this. We are so glad you've done so. And our prayer for you is simple, the love of Christ over your life. We pray that this online worship experience has been a blessing to you. And if it has, we want to ask you, invite you, encourage you to be a digital missionary with us. Share this service link with a friend or with your social feed. We really do appreciate that. And if you're in the Wilmington area and you've not been with us in person, we want to invite you. Join us for in-person worship gatherings each and every Sunday, 8 30, 10 a.m. Kids ministry rocking strong throughout the whole morning. There's something for everybody here at St. John's. And at 9 15, it's coffee, bagels, community connection, conversations, new friends. Come be with us in person. You can plan your visit. Just go to our website and hit Sundays at SJC, and we look forward to meeting you in person. So many ways that you can connect with us, either in person or online here at St. John's. Just go to our event hub at our website. You can explore the ways that you can connect with us. And we're so grateful for partnership today. Uh, so many people behind the scenes, front of the house, back of the house, in so many different ways. Uh, contribute to the mission and vision here at St. John's. Time, treasure, talent, it all comes together in a response of gratitude uh, to what the Lord has done for what the Lord has done for us. Uh, it's a response of gratitude to the graciousness of God in the gospel. Nothing better. We encourage you, if you haven't become a financial partner with us, uh, we invite you to jump on board. You can learn all about giving by going to our website, hitting the giving button, and that will open up a portal that will share with you an array of opportunities to be involved with us. Small gifts, large gifts, every gift adds up to help us make a difference in the lives of others for the sake of his name. May the Lord build in you and in me hearts of generosity as we respond in gratitude to the greatest gift of all. His name is Jesus. God bless you today in your giving. May God himself the God who makes everything holy and whole make you
put you together. Spirit, soul, and body. And keep you fit. For the coming of our Master. Jesus Christ. The one who called you. Is completely dependable. If he said it. He will do it. I love the dynamic at work today in today's gospel passage that when I recognize my own weakness, deficiency, uh, recognizing not what I am, but what I am not, in this case, the man who was born blind, in our case, our spiritual blindness, perhaps our weakness, our sinfulness, then we become the open target of the grace of God. We become... Uh, the recipients of the transformative power of the gospel through what Christ has come to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. When I claim I can already see, I know, I don't need any help, I'm strong, thanks but no thanks, then we wall ourselves off from the light that wants to come and transform our lives. Something powerful for us to pray about and think about this week. I know I'll be doing that. I'm sure you will as well. Hey, we want to stay connected with you. It's been so great to be with you today in our online worship experience. You can find us anywhere and everywhere on social media. I hope you'll connect with us there. And as you go today, remember Jesus loves you. He really, really does. And remember also that life is short. We don't have much time to guide in the hearts of those who travel with us. So let us be swift to love and make haste to be kind. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Till next time, everybody. Take care.